There is a need for a special meeting today. Uh, you please have a roll call, Monica. Here. 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 Okay, our first presentation will be the drop on graduation rate presentation. Good evening, President Rolla, distinguished members of the board, Superintendent DeBrego. Um, I've been asked to come and present Adam City High School's dropout and graduation rates. <clears throat> and so I'd like to get started on that. So the four-year historical graduation rates for um, Adam City High School was the highest it's been since 2001 at a 79.0% graduation rate. Um, we had a 79.2% completion rate, and the state graduation rate was 78.9, and the state completion rate was 80.3. So far, Adam City High School's current progress is uh, <clears throat> 335 seniors for the class of 2017, with 130 students that have already been accepted to one or more colleges. Last year, we had $1.7 million in scholarships. Our goal this year is $2.25 million. Um, on top of that, we just had a student that was accepted to Harvard and one that's received a full ride uh, scholarship to Georgetown University at $72,000 per year for four years. So that number is climbing really fast. We've also had eight Daniels Fund finalists, one uh, Greenhouse finalist, again, the Harvard and Georgetown and in one soccer scholarship and over 130 FAFSA completion forms. Now the federal application for financial aid or assistance, that application form predicts, the state says that it predicts uh, most likely those students that will go to college. So the state says if they fill that form out, most likely they will, they will attend college. Now what the state's done is they have what's called a matriculation right now. So instead of kids just attending college, we have to show that they are actually in college. So um, that's just more effort on our part to make sure that we are um, getting proof from those colleges to make sure that those kids are in college and that they are uh, um, attending. And one of the things we have to do is try to get their uh, email from the college and make sure that we have some sort of form because the state was using NCAA who said that they've had 96% of that um, information and it came to find out that this last SPF, uh, they really didn't have 96% of the information for those college students. Um, this is the four year district completion rate. The entire district completion rate is 67.3% and the state completion rate is 80.3%. So we are lacking district-wide of students completing um, in some form or another uh, than the state. Um, annual historic dropout rates. In 2016, their current dropout rate is 6.3% and the state com um, dropout rate is 2.3%. Um, if you can look up here at um, about 2003 to 2007, had some of the highest uh, dropout rates in the district. And I tried to look back and, and see what was going on at that time, and I wasn't able to identify anything except um, we have some funny things going on with our um, mobility rates. Now, moving to mobility, let me just continue with this dropout rate real quick. Um, so the district with alternative is 8.2%, and the state with alternative is 2.3%. Now remember with the alternative schools, you have a lot of kids who are coming back and forth because they're dealing with working, children, a lot of different things. So that, that rate is pretty high when it comes to um, alternative schools. The thing I want to bring to your attention when it comes to dropout rates is our mobility rate. Adam City High School's mobility rate in 2009-2010 was 36.2% um, of students coming in and out of the district. In 2010-11, it was 31. As you see it dropped in 2012 and 13, there was a change in the way they rated school's mobility rate. So mobility rate was calculated before the entire year. Now they're saying only students that leave before October count. So if a student leaves after October during that year 
they don't count as mobility rate, but they count as your dropout rate. So really, one would say that the mobility rate, if the rules were still the same, would be 42%. You could double that number. This is a, a district issue. Um, if you look at this, is the district mobility rate. In 2015-16, it was 19.3, um, again, with that new rule in place. But if you look at the district beforehand in 2009 and thereafter, it was <coughs> well above 30. This is a mobility calculation change in 2012. So currently, students who transfer to a school within the same district cover over the summer are not counted as mobile students. This rule will be extended this year so that students who transfer over the summer, um, notice this is the summer transfer only, to different districts will also not count as a mobile student. The record for the student must follow the format below. And those are our codes for um, a student to leave school, um, enters another school, and, and, and thus, thus um, th those are just our codes. Um, but the key component here is the entry date must be prior to October 1st. So we're looking at mobility rates. Anything prior to counts as a mobility rate. If it's after, it doesn't. And we started tracking down these kids. We were finding out that a lot of them were leaving <coughs> in February and March. And so if they leave in February and March and don't come back to school until the next year, that still counts as a dropout for that current year. Now when you look at kids leaving our district to go to another district, if you look at what's happening in February and March, that's testing. So when a student leaves and says they're not going to go to Adams 14, for whatever circumstances it may be, and they go to another district, that district may not and most likely will not, unless they can prove absolutely that they are residents of that district, get enrolled because of, because of testing. So what are we doing for our dropout students? Um, we applied for an EARS grant for expelled and at-risk students. We had $250,000 for three years that provides supports with school programming, and these are the following that we use EARS grant for. Yes, mentoring, which is a leadership course for at-risk students, and right now we have 87 ninth through 12th grade students served to date. We also have Homies Unidos, uh, risk gang or violence. We currently have 90 students that are being served to date. CYC, um, attendance support for at-risk students. We also have EARS tutoring on top of the 21st century tutoring, tutoring for after school and summer school opportunities. We have diversion, opportunities for students to correct behavior prior to legal interaction. And we have our TAP meetings um, with two attendance liaisons. The Truancy Action Plan is developed for extreme cases of attendance. Currently 56 students on plans and 11 in court at this time. We also use attendance contracts with family support, um, school attendance contracts for students with excessive absences. Currently, we have 75 students to date on attendance contracts. We also have the Pathways um, with a Future Center and four counselors to advise and support students in obtaining their dreams and strong focus on what students want. Rather than making sure that everybody goes through the same uh, course load, we make sure that we are actually identifying what kids want to do when they leave high school. We also have restorative justice, and that's an approach to resolve conflict and problem resolutions prior to just implementing um, behavior um, and consequences. That's what we have thus far. Is there any questions? I do. Yes. I think one of the questions I asked before we did the, mm -hmm. the dropout rate was how many freshmen started the school year and how many freshmen was today. I didn't see that in your presentation. I'm sorry, I must have missed that piece. I didn't catch that. How many freshmen do we have currently? Yes, and okay. it was how many freshmen you had started the school year and how many freshmen that was today that was considered to be part of the dropout rate. And then I asked you how many seniors today was freshmen that started the seniors today. That's what I was asking about the dropout rate. And then I believe I was concerned about the counselors mm -hmm. because 
we have four counselors, and what's the total of students in the district? 1879, I believe, was the count yeah. just recently. So you wanted, um, Mr. Thomas, you wanted the, how many freshmen Start. graduated no. or did not? How many freshmen uh -huh. started the school year, the beginning of school? How many freshmen are here today? Gotcha. That would have gave us a total of a dropout rate. How many kids left or whatnot? Then I asked how many kids today are seniors that started four years ago. That would have gave us a dropout rate too. How many kids we lost between the last four years? So I had to go get this here. So the four-year dropout rate is those freshmen up to that time? Right, but uh, I believe number. I read that, here you go. I believe I had to go look because I didn't see that in your presentation over the weekend. So what I had to go get was um, the past three years, it was 1,782 kids at the high school 2015-16. But I had to break it down as an average. And my question was, it was going to be about counselors and the dropout rate with the counselors. How many counselors have enough time to see the students? And what you just gave me was 1,879. That's close to 470 <coughs> students per counselor. And we only had 160 days, calendar days this year. So I'm assuming if we do the math correct, that's almost 2.9, if not three, um, students that a, teach, that a counselor can see probably per day, if not more, <coughs> and on their days, if they have to step out. So that was my question was, and then I, if you look at the list, I looked at Kearney. And Kearney kids, 2015-16, had 821. But I do notice on Kearney's website, they have a counselor for the sixth grade, seventh grade, and eighth grade, and they have a dean. So the question would be, if they got 821 and they barely seeing maybe 225 mm -hmm. um, students without a, within the school year, how come are we seeing, our counselors are seeing double that amount? And I'm sure, and I'm not hypothetically speaking, but I know they can't see all those students within 160 days, over 400 some students per day. So that's where I was um, asking, because if I'm not mistaken, I read that they go to dropout rate, go all the way back to the sixth, seventh grade, each year all the way to their senior year. Is that correct? The dropout, yeah, the district dropout rate, yeah. Right. Definitely. So we're losing kids from 7th, 8th, 9th, 10th, 11th, even though we might have a, 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 a outstanding graduate rate, but we're losing kids at the, at the beginning of the year, mm -hmm. which is 300-some students to 200-some students. We are losing. So my question is, um, we, as a district, we might gain 70 or 80 percent, which is a good graduating rate, but mm -hmm. I'm concerned about counselors. My concern is that we are to invest in our district for our kids at least four more counselors, two for each grade level, because if I'm not mistaken, Kearney is doing an outstanding job. And that's not saying Adam City not or the high school not, but I'm saying the ratio rate per student is lower that a, a counselor can um, look at and keep a, a accountability of a student. So it's hard for any counselor to see over five to 600 students. And if I'm not mistaken, that might have been what we had freshmen coming into this year. And I think Ms. Hernandez is there. She's the, is that, do you know? How many freshmen did we see at the beginning? How many freshmen started at the beginning of the school year? No, okay. Yeah, I know this is one of our largest classes, though. This was our largest yeah. class. So we had one, one counselor 
to see 500, 600. Yeah, yeah, you're you're absolutely right, and I would agree 100% with you. I, I think we could use more counselors, um, <clears throat> and I would also like to to say that you know, um, when I brought up the mobility rate, that that's concerning not only just for the high school, but that's concerning for our district, because when I looked at the um, mobility rate, I looked at why are people leaving and not coming back, and the two things that I could kind of conclude is one, the rents has increased in this area as, and so has property values. So I'm seeing that as we have a mobile um, uh, clientele, they leave and they can't come back at times. Not only that, I'm seeing that there's a lot of schools out there, online schools and other charter organizations that take kids without properly coding them in the district, in the, in the system, and so we never find out where they're at until the following year. And so um, Yvonne is currently looking at, and we've, we've <coughs> concluded that the majority of the students have been placed in other districts, but it's been this year. So those students that you're seeing that are dropouts last year are in districts this year, but because they didn't report them until the following year, they still count as a dropout on us. So I would say that if we had more counselors, yes, we can do more home visits and we can do more things like that in order to make sure that we actually know where these kids are going and making sure that they are in school, whether their, um, homing si their home situation has changed. But I agree, we are, we are losing too many kids and it's, a, it's an epidemic, it's a problem. And you brought up the um, graduation rate in your presentation and I have a copy for you. And this is, and I got this out for our website, the high school website, is the, are our students receiving the 23 credits? Because this is what the web, Adam City High School website has. Yeah, they have to have 23 credits to, to, to walk across that stage. Okay, so if they have 23 credits and we losing uh, approximately almost 300 students within a uh, time period, um, how is the counselor to know what a student is behind, how is the counselor to know to catch up, what is the summer school rate, what is the night school rate, what is a counselor to know besides not seeing a student, not to know what are the uh, particulars for that student to graduate. So each kid in their CUM file has a, not only in their CUM file but also in IC, uh, we track all their credits that they have. So if a student was to leave and then come back and they didn't have transfer credits, we have what we currently have on, on file. Um, if they have credits, then we transfer those credits in. No. So it's a, it's a running chart, I mean. I, I understand that's what, what you're, you're asking. saying, Mr. Thompson. No, my question is, how are we losing our students at the beginning of the year, if we're losing close to 300 students by the time they graduate, how do we know how many credits they are short? How many credits do we know? How many kids was going to summer school? How many kids going to night school? How are we keeping track of our kids with the counselors? So we only keep track of our kids. You're asking me, so, so if a freshman was credit deficient, how are we tracking them if they went to summer school or to night school? Everything. That's all, on their, that's all in, the, in the file. That's all in IC. That's all in, in their CUME file on their credit, um, uh, uh, credit form. So if you were short, so if a student was short in English, that counselor has a conversation with them and says, you need to pick up one credit of English rather than picking up uh, an elective class. So it, it, it is time consuming, it is a lot of work. I'm not saying that it's not, but it is something that you have to do. You, you can't have a student without identifying their needs. Now, I'm a Speak as a parent, mm -hmm. which um, is going to be a little hard for me. But if I'm a parent and I go on the school, the high school website, mm -hmm. and I click on our staff, there's about 10 to 15 staff members with no picture. There's about 10 to 15 staff members with no phone numbers. There's a couple of staff members with no information at all. So if I'm a parent, mm -hmm. how am I going to call my student's teacher 
to, to if there's no number, no picture. I'm, I'm just concerned about that. Then, if I'm a parent and I want to see what is the teacher doing, and this is all coming off the high school website. This is for you, sir. Okay. I understand, and this was, it says December. It says that this is the PDF for the high school teachers. Is any of these people still here in this district, or do, is this, do this even count? No, I don't know why this, this should have been removed. No, that, I got a note here to update the website and remove. I'm just, but I'm a, I'm a parent, now I'm a board member. Right. And I see a PDF that have teachers and everybody not even working in this school district on the high school website. Mm -hmm. That's unacceptable. Absolutely, I agree. I'll get that changed. Here you go, Mr. Thompson. This um, district takes drug and alcohol abuse very seriously, grief counseling very seriously, bulletin very seriously, um, counseling, therapy, justice, mental health. Is this the high school's letter, or this says January the 8th, 2014? And this is all off the high school's website. Is this person still working for the district? No, he's not. So what I'm trying to get at is we're losing 300 per students right. from seventh grade till they graduate. We are not doing our job up here as this diocese. And it's not, don't all fall back on you, but I'm just saying if a parent Go read these letters. Go look at the PDF. Website's not up to date. And, if, and then if I, if a student go on the website, the high school, there's um, activities with um, no sponsors on there, or sponsors not even in the district. And then this is the one that got me the most was this one. <clears throat> Student Board of Education. Um, and then the seat is to my left. Responsibilities to advise the Adams 14 Board of Education to participate in development review policies, regulations, procedures that affect the student body of Adams 14. That's on the website. Um, when would this board have someone in students so we can um, have a dialogue with them to see what the problem is, maybe how we can help to bridge the gap of why are they dropping out, why are they leaving, what's the problem? Because um, I think President Roller brought it up several times that the board does need to interact with the kids and find out and ask some questions. Um, but this is on the website. We haven't had a, a student council at this desk in many moons. So um, I hope we can get that taken care of. I'm out of questions. Yeah, I, I would like to get that uh, going as well, too. And I, I believe um, Mr. Dryling was, um, had some interest in um, going to the high school and, and, and working with those students as soon as we, and I know there was some talk about next year would be a good year to get it started instead of mid-year. I'm just waiting to hear when to show up. Yeah, we need to find a sponsor for one. I know the sponsor that was doing it before, she didn't want to do it any longer. Okay. Um, and I know Mr. Guardiola was doing what he could to make sure that it was a seamless effort. 
and so we can find another sponsor. Um, but last time we, there was some discussion about just starting fresh next year. Well, I think you, next year is a little too late. Okay. If you would, would like, I could start. Yeah, I think we can okay. start now. I, and I only have one comment about the, the dropout rate. You, you know, I understand about mobility and all that, but maybe people are dropping out and want to go to different districts because we're the last in the state in our scores. There could be a lot of reasons. I mean, I would I say mean, a lot of kids go to Prairie View for that is, reason. High rents is fine to, to blow smoke, but the bottom line is we're last in the state in scores. And if I was a parent that had a kid here, I wouldn't send my kid here yeah. until the scores were up. Absolutely, and we lose a lot of kids to, pra pra to Prairie View for that. Now, I can tell you right now we have nine, nine finalists for the state in, in wrestling. I got to tell you, they have a, a doggone good club going on, and some of those kids go up to Prairie View because of our current status of our, of our rating. So I agree. Sure. And that's no slam against our teachers or our staff because I think we have excellent staff yeah. uh, in the district. But we, and I understand we're, on the, we're working on getting those scores up, Absolutely. and it's a slow progress, but I think it's more of that than anything. Yeah, but I, I, ju I did want to bring up the mobility rate because it is an issue, and I'm seeing sure. it. So it's just something to keep you know, in the back of your mind. Yes, I have a couple questions, yes. Mr. Thomas. Uh, number one, how are the kids or the students being let known of how many credits they have or how many they're behind? Who's talking to them? Because as Mr. Thomas pointed out, they probably see a counselor once a year. Mm -hmm. And realistically, if we're going to keep tabs on our students, we should be seeing them at least twice a year, one at each semester, so we can talk to them. I, I, how do are, are the ki students kept informed of where they stand instead of the last minute? Because I remember last year, a couple kids were trying, oh, failed their junior uh, English, and they're trying to do senior and junior English. That's it, there's no way it's gonna work. I mean, so how, the, how are you, is the high school tracking to make sure these kids know where they stand? We track it just like we always have. Um, it is a tough effort to make sure that you're talking to each and every kid. I'm not gonna sit up here and pretend that we they're getting every single kid on time. Um, we wouldn't have credit recovery if that was the case. We do need more support. Um, I do know when I took over the high school at that time that a lot of conversations didn't happen until their 12th grade year. And so, you know, fixing that 12th grade year, going to 11th and trying to, trying to backtrack. We did implement LINK this year. Um, I am currently working on a grant for, um, it's called AIM High, and it's to kind of implement some of those things into the ninth graders. And so when they come in, they have that conversation with counselors, they have that conversation with leaders. The LINK leaders are talking to kids. Um, we did a, an extra effort to make sure that we went down to the uh, middle schools more often than one time um, last year. We also, um, remember, gave the kids their schedules. It was, I think, March in the spring before they even entered school so we can get them kind of excited about going and having those conversations early. But I don't think you can have enough conversations, enough conversation with the ninth grader. We, um, we'll do our best, but we do need some yeah. more help. But maybe here's a suggestion, Yeah. which when I, when I taught, these are things that we did, and I don't know is that every teacher should be assigned, I don't know how many teachers you have up there, but every teacher, should, we had 15 students, I don't know if Connie remembered that, and teach, students would sign up with teachers that they want to, could have conversations with, and they would meet at least once every nine weeks, and the teacher could go over how they were going towards their graduation to make, and I don't know if Joe was part of that when he was in school or not, but they would go and they meet with their teacher and I could say, Joe, what the heck's going on in the math? <coughs> you know, you're gonna fall behind and it's gonna be harder than heck to get caught up. So I think if, if use what we have, we have good teachers as Mr. Dryling stated, let's use them. Let's use them for our students and don't, you know, let the students pick their teachers. Somebody that they feel comfortable with working with, they can always elaborate and say this is, <coughs> Uh, well, I'm working late, you know, I, I, I closed down McDonald's or right. whatever, and I've had those students, but at least they would be up at all the time and know where they stand and not trying to wait for the counselor to get them. So that's just Was that suggest. more like an advisory or? Advisory, right. Okay. 
Kind of, for me, it was more like a mentorship. And the, the teacher was also a sounding board of, for college. Because a lot of these parents don't know how to apply for grants and it, to talk to the kids about college because a lot of them never been to college. Right. And for me, you know, the teacher was, what do I need to do to get to college? I mean, you say we have almost, a, what, a third of kids going to college? For me, that's not a success rate. We should be two-thirds or more going to college. Oh, absolutely. You know, I think, I think uh, and not taking any away from the, the third that has applied for college, but I agree with you. We don't have enough counselors to guide these kids, and if we had a process where the teachers could step in and they're comfortable talking with the child, we could identify more issues than just attending class or dropping out. Yeah. So that third, that was kids who have been accepted already. That's early admission. That's a huge jump um, before it really starts coming in. So that's a huge increase than what it was last, last year at this time. So early admissions, we've already got quite a few kids in college. So that's a, that's a positive. Then I guess uh, elaborate on that. Have you ever thought about hiring a counselor who is just particularly in charge with seniors that want to go to college? Look up the scholarships that our students could apply for and can get. And so if you have somebody mm -hmm. who's, that's their job, not to counsel and with the others, but to counsel, say, you want to go to college? If you want to go to college, go see Mr. Archuleta here. He's our counselor. He'll help you in all the things you need. And so... I mean, that's just another thing that you can look at. Well, that's Where our future I? center. That's, that's specifically for seniors, college, scholarships. Um, when we first developed this, the center, there was only $700,000 in scholarships for our students. We've increased that over a million dollars just in implementing that, that future center. So that we, that's exactly what we're doing. L let me ask you a question. Yeah. Do we not have to start like at the ninth and 10th grade level to apply for scholarships for kids now? I mean, is it too late by senior year? No, it's never, it's never too late. You know, a lot of times students fill out applications for scholarships because nobody filled them out. Um, you'll be surprised at how many kids get last minute money and opportunities because nobody took the, they didn't think they could get in or they took the time to fill out the scholarship. We always tell our kids, you know, if you fill out a scholarship and it takes you an hour and that scholarship's worth $5,000, you just made five thousand dollars an hour. Right. That's what you're worth. So, I guess the final question will be: Are we tracking the kids that go to college? Are they staying in school? Because there's a big record where our kids go for one semester. They don't like being away from home, so they yeah. drop out and go. Are we tracking those? And I'll be honest: I had a nephew who, 2010, all these kids went to college, were going to college, and all this. He told me there were only nine that finished. I mean, you got to work on that too. There's yeah, no absolutely. Sense sending them if they don't know what they're doing. So that's what the new state's matriculation rate is. It's no longer that you just get to graduate kids and say, "Oh, we graduated 80 percent." Now matriculation comes in and it says, "Okay, you got you graduate 80 percent. Where are they?" And instead of holding the colleges accountable, now they're holding us accountable. And that's why it's so important for us to build up that future center because not only is it just about graduating kids, it's about making sure they're in college and they're staying in college. Uh, one of the things we're doing here in our district, which is um, a lot of districts are looking to, to mimic, is that you know, when we do our college visits, we make sure that we're talking to the colleges about um, families visiting, not just the kids, because we have a lot of parents who don't feel comfortable with their young ladies leaving the city and going up to a, a, a college and not knowing what this college is about. So um, I know CSU is huge, and we started a new trend over there where now our families are going, and there's strollers, and there's everything going on up there. And I personally go up twice a year to CSU to make sure that I'm meeting with our students. As I was principal, I still done it to this day. But um, meeting with our students and making sure that um, they're coming back to have those conversations as alumni. And so those kids are kind of building up a family we were up there last uh, December, and there were two students um, from Adam City High School that wished that they had this program when they were in school because there's only two of them left, and they came up with like six or seven. Right now, we have 36 up there, Good. so it's and, growing. Uh, also, I just want to make sure that we educate our students and our families that uh, 
if you don't, you know, you never get enough scholarship. I mean, you get right. good money unless you get the Daniels or uh, fun. But other than that, making sure that our kids understand that if you get a student loan, that's going to have to be paid. And to make sure that, especially if there's question mm -hmm. about them going to college, to me, I'm a believer every student should maybe go to a front, ra or front range or a junior college or something to make sure that they go. Because if I go to CSU, I don't know what it is, now 40000 a year, 60000 a year, mm -hmm. and they keep going, I mean, they're like getting a mortgage for a home. And I did hear on the news one time this woman, 67 years old, when she was young, went to college, never paid back her student loan. Well, guess what? She didn't get her Social Security check. Yeah. So we got to make sure that we educate our students on. Yeah. That's why we do a big push for scholarships, so we can kind of ease that burden. Another thing, too, is concurrent enrollment um, and them taking college classes while they're in school, because we know sometimes that <clears throat> kids looking at college tuition, that could be a deterrent. And so if we can get them as many credits as possible before they leave here, instead of college looking at, you know, a community college $5,000 um, to finish, you could really be looking at $800 to finish. So. Dr. Brago, I like <clears throat> the next um, board meeting for the counselors at the high school to give us a presentation. I can arrange that. We just have to see how many presentations we have on the board already. I'm not quite sure. I don't know how many the board members want. Or they can meeting. give us a study session. We can come okay. in and do a study session. And I think too. that would be very good, a study session. That way we could get more work done. Any other questions? Because we're already half hour behind. Okay, thank you. Thank you. All right, moving on, nutrition. Good evening, Mr. Rola, distinguished members of the board, and Dr. Abrego. My name is Naomi Stenson. I'm the Director of Nutrition Services and Warehouse, and I'm here to give you a brief presentation on nutrition services and the work that we're doing. At the last board meeting, it was requested that nutrition services come and talk about the work that we're doing, um, and some concerns were expressed. Since that time, I met with Mr. Rolla and Mr. Dryling and Dr. Abrego, and we talked about um, some challenges that we have with regulations, um, some great work that my staff is doing, and just answered questions. So I'm here to just give a brief presentation, and then I can answer questions. But I think uh, Mr. Rolla and Mr. Dryling could share with you that a lot of questions were clarified. Um, moving to the next slide. Oh, sorry. I think last time, Monica, you did that for me. <laughs> All right, so I just want to share with you, I'm not going to go through and read our vision and mission statement, but just want to let you know that our goal is to feed the children so they can go back to the classroom and learn. And I want to point out that our mission statement was developed by our very own nutrition team. They came up with three mission statements, and it was shared with approximately 60 employees and voted on. So we firmly believe in the work that we're doing. This next slide is a picture of our nutrition staff. We have approximately 60 employees working hard every day to feed the kids nutritious meals. Um, this picture was taken just a couple weeks ago during a professional development training day. Uh, so you can see we have a great group of people working for us. So I'm gonna move on and I know, you know I'm moving kind of quickly. So if, um, if I miss something or you have questions, please let me know. But I just wanna kind of highlight some of the things that we talked about during our meeting on February 3rd. Um, I discussed and shared program requirements that we have to follow in order to get reimbursement from the government. The board was provided with a handout, sort of like a talking point about nutrition services that gives you kind of an overview of some of the regulations that we have to comply with in order to take 
reimbursement from the government. We talked about some of the good work that we've done over the last several years. I've been here for about a year. Katie, uh, who is my assistant director, is going to share some more details on the good work that's been done the last three years she's been here. But one of the things that I think is pretty neat is that we offer a salad bar to all of our kids and we offer eight different fruits and vegetables every day which you do not see in every district sometimes it's only three or four choices um, so i think that's a big deal that we're exposing <coughs> our kids to a variety of fruits and vegetable choices um, other accomplishments include offering professional development training more than we ever have before it is a requirement from USDA to um, provide staff training, but we are offering training in the amount of 12 or more hours annually. And really, um, we're doing more than that. So I think that's a big accomplishment. During the meeting, I responded to questions and concerns. Um, if the board has any, I can you know, answer those at the end of the pre presentation and then we also talked about opportunities our department is looking for ways to collaborate with the community so for example I shared with um, the board members that we're trying to collaborate with the food bank um, in a way that either they could provide our students with opportunity so for example I've worked with food banks before where they offered a backpack program a backpack program related to food where children could take a backpack of food home for over the weekend. Um, some of our kids heavily rely on the meals that we offer Monday through Friday. Uh, so we're working on that and then the other thing if we have cooked leftovers we want to discuss an opportunity instead of throwing it away in the trash maybe donating it to our food bank which is not uncommon for a lot of food service estab establishments to do. So we're working on those current opportunities. Challenges for nutrition services, probably the biggest thing is some of the regulations don't allow us to do the things that maybe our students want us to do. I've met with several parent groups where we talk about um, their concerns and the biggest one that's expressed to me is the lack of sodium in food. And USDA requires that we limit sodium in our recipes. Uh, it's very strict, and actually it's going to be more strict this July. Um, so we're going to have challenges in developing recipes that are tasteful to the children. Uh, because at home, we can add salt and different um, flavorings that have sodium in them. Um, another challenge is probably meeting the regulation and meeting what the kids like. Um, Katie's going to talk about how we go about doing that. And then rising labor costs. As you know, um, minimum wage is going to go up. And um, the more scratch cooking that we do, Sometimes it requires more labor. Um, so those are some of the challenges that we deal with. I'm going to hand it over to Katie Cosette. She is the Assistant Director of Nutrition Services. Hello. Um, my primary job is creating recipes and um, the menus that the students get. I have two degrees in culinary arts. I was a chef for 10 years and I'm a registered dietitian. Uh, I love the job. It's challenging to meet all the regulations and to provide meals that students enjoy. Uh, when I started here about three and a half years ago, there really weren't established recipes for staff to follow. There was a lot of scratch cooking going on, but uh, um, not an understanding on how to go about the scratch cooking. So we started training. We started teaching um, cooking skills. We started branching their knowledge out on how to be more efficient with their time so that they have more time to spend on building the recipes and making it look attractive. Um, I would see gray broccoli and, and over steamed or overcooked vegetables, which isn't appealing to students either. 
So we've worked really hard to poll the students. We do satisfaction surveys every year during National School Lunch Week. I poll all the students and read them on paper, and I read every single one of them. I build my recipes and my menus off of what students don't like and what they're requesting to have. I ask in the survey, what, what would you like to see on the lunch line? A lot of times you get cupcakes and cake and stuff like that, but I've gotten some really useful information. Uh, like they don't like the macaroni and cheese. It was very apparent they didn't like it, but a lot of kids were requesting goulash. So we made the recipe, we developed it, we tested it with students at Hanson Elementary, got their feedback, tweaked the recipe, and now it's on the menu. Uh, that's one of the ways we do things. I also do plate waste studies. We've done them on fresh uh, fruits and vegetables, canned fruits and vegetables and frozen to see which one was being thrown out the most um, to evaluate that. We've done it milk versus water waste in that aspect and we've done it um, fruits and vegetables waste in our district versus Mapleton Public Schools because they have a shared table for their fruits and vegetables after lunch. But um, just to compare to see where we're at in comparison with other districts and where we can improve. I'm gonna pass it off to Ms. Maribel, who is a kitchen supervisor at Hanson Elementary. Good evening. <clears throat> My name is Maribel. I currently serve the Adams 14 student staff, families, and community as our nutrition services supervisor at Hanson Elementary. I began in Adams 14 as a substitute in 2012. Um, during the tenure, I have served in the roles of substitute, covering for supervisors in many of our kitchens throughout the district. Um, I worked at STARS for a while, um, and now I am permanent supervisor at, Ken at Hanson. Our staff <clears throat> coordinates together in order to share routines, ensure that our students are efficiently moving through the food line. Um, the fact that we have created a streamlined process of the breakfast and lunch improves the reimbursable meals for us. Our students, staff, and families enjoy fresh and nutrition meals daily. I am proud of the work I have done for these children and working for Commerce City. Uh, are you done? Yeah, so that's kind of it in a nutshell. But I just want to extend an invitation if ever you want to join me for lunch and learn more about the work that we're doing in Adams 14. Um, I'm happy. I'm pretty much eating lunch in the kitchens every day. So just let me know the day. Any discussion? You're lucky. All right, thank you. Have a good night. Moving on to uh, accountability update. Remember, sir, you only have five minutes. <laughs> And thank you. I think they're getting shorter, so I'll do the best I can. But uh, just wanted to give the board a quick update on uh, accountability. And really, the most important thing is that we have two plans that we're going forward with. The first one is the high school innovation plan, and the second one is the district's turnaround plan. So the most important thing that we have been doing is going to the schools, the high school primarily, and making sure that all their teachers are involved in writing their innovation plan and letting them know that there is a timeline. So if things all fall according to plan, the high school's innovation plan and the district's turnaround plan will be completed this week. My goal is to take a look at their plans, meet with the Colorado Department of Education representative, make sure that everything that is supposed to be in the plan is in the turnaround plan and in the innovation plan for them to give us suggestions on what we need to do, if there's any components missing, or we need to condense the plan to make it easy for the uh, people at the state board to read and um, uh, go through that process. All that will be taking place this week. So once we do that, then we have certain steps that we have to do, and that's basically present the plan to the school board and get your approval. Uh, that would be, hopefully, if uh, that would be March. In April, we would go in front of the Colorado Department of Education Commissioner present the plan to them and they should approve our plan because we are getting a census from them in writing the plan and I said that last step where we meet the call with the Colorado Department of Education and they support us in that plan it will uh, it will be a plan that they have supported and then the last stage would be 
in the last month in May to put uh, do a to present the plan to the State Board of Education and get their final approval. And that's probably the most important component because if we do get our plans approved, then we move forward. And basically the turnaround plan for the high school, you already know that we, we modified the calendar a little bit to add some more instructional days. We have a partnership with an external uh, partner which is beyond textbooks. We are also offering bioliteracy classrooms and adding one each year. And then we are requiring, or we will require an ELD certificate for all our teachers. Those are all in the turnaround plan to support all of our schools. And use uh, the high school has in their innovation plan pathways for the students. If you want a four-year degree, you take the rigorous courses. And I agree with Mr. Uh, Thomas that it's very important that the students meet with the parents and the counselors to make that plan for four years so the students get that four-year rigorous plan. If a student does not want to go to a four-year college, there should be a two-way path that they are presenting, and that is a student that wants to maybe pursue a two-year degree, cosmetology, culinary arts, that will be available for the students. And maybe if I'm a student that doesn't want either of those tracks and I just want to do a, a one-year certificate, for example, welding, so that I can obtain a good job, that pathway, pathway will also be available to the students. But our key is to work closely with the State Department to make sure that when we go in front of the state board, we get an approval of what Atlas 14 wants and not get something uh, pushed on us. So right now, everything is going smooth. Uh, hopefully this week we'll finish up the last part. And then we're going to ask the high school to vote on their innovation plan so that when we bring the plan to you, we can say that the high school teachers were all involved. They voted on this specific plan to move forward. And that way, when we go to the state board, we have support from you as a school board. We have uh, support from all our teachers, our union, and we just want to move forward and do what's best for our district. That's what I have. Is there any questions? <clears throat> okay. You're Thank you very look. much. It is 640 right now. Let's take a five minute Go to the restroom, do, get a drink or whatever. Then five minutes, Connie. Because <laughs> I'm the woman. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> That's it. Call this meeting to order on February 14th, 2017 at 645. Oh, February 14th, that's Halloween, I mean, not Halloween. <laughs> Thanks, uh, Valentine's. Sorry for all you young ladies to have to be here instead of with your sweethearts, but you should have told us we could have moved the meeting, but now you got to pay the price. So, uh, so call to order, let's please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance and a moment of silence. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Monica, can we have, can we please have roll call? Ms. Here. Mr. Here. 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 I need a motion for the approval of the January 24th, 2017 minutes. So moved. Second. Second. Is there any discussion? Hearing none, can we have roll call, Monica, please? Aye. 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 Mr. Aye. 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 I need a motion for the approval of the January 31st, 2017 minutes. So moved. Second. Second. Okay. Is there any discussion? Hearing none, can we have roll call, Monica, please? Mr. Aye. Mr. 
Aye. 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 I need a motion for the approval of the agenda. So moved. Second. Is there a discussion? Hearing none, could I have roll call, Monica? Aye. 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 Okay, moving on to recognition and celebrations, uh, Dr. Abrego. Yes, we have two. Our first one is going to be our public engagement engagement officer, Janelle Asmus, who will be highlighting an outstanding individual in her department. For once, I'm not going to stand in front of you and say, whereas. <laughs> So thank you, President Rolla, Vice President, Mrs. Quintana, uh, distinguished members of the board, Superintendent Abrego. Um, this is Barbara Human, who is also on my team, and we're pleased to present the following recognition. I'm honored to present to you a staff member who is essential in meeting a number of this board's strategic imperatives. These are the two that she's really uh, key in to significantly empower all families and community members to become engaged partners in their child's education by creating welcoming environment district-wide that reflect and support culturally diverse populations, and to intentionally increase and improve communication district-wide, both internally and externally, as well as enhance the resources offered to our current clients and community members. So at this time, I'd like to invite Guadalupe Calaevo to come forward and join me at the podium. <laughs> if Ms. Calaevo looks surprised or bewildered, bear with us. She had no idea that she was being considered for this recognition until just now. <laughs> Now I get to say a bunch of good stuff about you. Um, never one to boast or seek the limelight, Ms. Carrievo is quite, just quietly and expertly goes about the work performing some of the most important functions for our community, parents, and students. As the district's translator interpreter, Ms. Carrievo provides the connection between the district and schools with our clients. She literally helps everyone understand what everyone else is saying, whether it's in English or Spanish. People rely on her translation of words, intent, and meaning to better understand our education system and for our district to understand the values and priorities of our community. The community has come to love and appreciate Ms. Carrievo. And not only just her work, but the way she goes about delivering her services. People look for her when they're coming to an important meeting in Adams 14. She's our built-in trust factor. Ms. Caraveo is known to have a positive attitude and support, a supportive approach to her work. You genuinely feel she's so excited to see you when she greets you. And she gets more hugs from more people than I've ever seen in my <laughs> career. She's extremely responsive to all of those she serves, and she is the best overall professional in her field that I've ever worked with. Ms. Caraveo also extends her assistance to areas outside her normal work responsibilities. As an example, uh, is that she quickly responded to a request from our HR department to collaborate on creating and implementing a staff recognition program. Imagine that. <laughs> she took the request and transformed it into a well-researched and operational plan, which is being implemented even as we speak. Similarly, she's often called upon by special education student services to translate during IEP staffings or hearings. She always rearranges her schedule to accommodate these requests because it's for the kids. So please join me in honoring Ms. Guadalupe Caraveo. <laughs> Okay, and now you get to have a okay. <laughs> uh, Are you going to give a speech? <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much. I'm so excited. 
Uh, the moment I walk in into this district, I fall in love with this community, the kids, the families, and I feel like a, every single meeting that I walk in is my family who is around me. So thank you so much for this. It's not deserved, I promise you, because oh. I enjoy every single moment I'm here. Thank you. <laughs> more just to be sure for you. Ready, set. Thank you. Did you add another one? Or yes, just we one? have one more. I'd like to have Principal Paul Sandals from Lester Arnold High School. Please come up here and just give us a little information on the results of that Adam, Adams County Youth Initiative Survey. Good evening. If, if I may approach the dice, I'm not sure if you guys received this. You probably did, but um, every one that's walking near Lester Arnold High School in the last month received a copy. Um, we're very, very excited about these results. Um, I have a couple of people here to uh, help me explain what we're doing. Come on up. They're never shy until they have to come over <laughs> here with me, right? So they're there. When uh, when I came to, to Lester Arnold last year, we, we knew we wanted to, to take the the template, if you will, that Johnny Thompson had said and that we wanted to make some changes, and, and we did. And one of the things that we really did, and Mr. Rolla, thank you for at the DAC meeting, talking about culture and climate and the importance and that we knew that we had to, to attack this first. One of the first things that we did, uh, um, Mr. Leggy brought to me, was um, Mr. Sanders, we need to do restorative justice. We need to be able to mediate every day and every why and everything. And so um, really quick, would you tell them what, what we're doing with restorative justice? He didn't know. <laughs> no, basically, um, a lot of the the situations that we end up at Lester Arnold require a lot of proactive type of situations where, as adults in the building, we show a lot of love, compassion. It's a very family feel when you walk in the door, and the kids come to understand that um, the way they're going to be treated in our house is very um, it's it's predictable, and it becomes uh, it pr provides a lot of confidence for the kids because essentially them and their families are, are able to really understand prior to any situations that arise or or any, anything that might involve a conflict. They, they know the consequences that may come um, are going to be fair. Uh, they're, they're very predictable, and they're, and they're easy to understand. There's no surprises. And so um, that coupled with a lot of love and a lot of just honest conversations and, and, and as much proactive behavior as possible on the part of the adults and the kids, for that matter, um, situations come to be very, uh, very easy to handle um, in our in our. In our uh, not only in our discipline, but also just every aspect of our day, whether it be through instruction or any other type of interaction between adults and students in our house. And so that, to, to the very basic nature of restorative justice, um, there's a lot of, uh, the name says, it, it says what it needs to in the fact that there's, there's, a, um, there's a relationship that comes to embody everything in our family. And it comes um, with a lot of honesty and respect, like I said prior. And so um, that basically sums up what we do as far as restorative justice in, in uh, a variety of different contexts um, at Lester Arnold. At, at Lester, we, we don't have an assistant principal, and I, I don't have a social worker. So we, we do everything. We wear 100 hats. 
Um, Judy Sims is our instructional coach as well as the site. Okay. Uh, I haven't done that in a year. Judy Sims, oh, Judy Hell, I haven't done that for a while. Um, Ms. Hell, I put them together. Ms. Hell uh, covers a lot of bases with our assessment and everything else that we do, and, and it's just huge for us. Um, on the other part was um, Jared Dear Guerrero, who is our dean and, and does an amazing job, but he came to me with an idea for a Discover program that we really wanted to work on the principles of highly effective teens and that we wanted to bring this to our children on a day-to-day -day basis, and in fact, we've made it a class. Um, Mr. Dear Guerrero. Um, <clears throat> I'm sorry for my voice. I was coaching all weekend. Um, <laughs> but, um, so Mr. Leggy and I, um, work a lot together, uh, share an office, and one of the things, um, thanks to uh, Miss Cardassus and the EARS grant, we were able to go last summer and get trained in the Discovery program um, by who a guy named Eric Larson, who wrote the book um, 25 um, years ago and been adapting it ever since. Um, I kind of got an idea of it from Miss Delorenzo, who came from um, Hidden Lake um, Alternative High School in Westminster. Um, who um, uses the discovery program um, as a basis to kind of set up a culture in the school. Um, really at the basis of it, what, what makes it effective um, is one, we made every family come to an orientation this year where we, uh, we explained to them what was going on on a day-to-day -day basis, what was gonna happen inside the classroom in terms of classroom management from room to room. The expectations were gonna be the same. Um, and our expectations for attendance, um, and then basically just kind of what the, the core um, aspects are of the discovery program are these six P's, being prompt, being prepared, being polite, having a positive mental attitude, participating, and producing quality work. And really what we tried to drive home is that if we can get these six P's ingrained in our kids, that these are going to be things that they can take into the, the real world not just high school, not just in the classroom, not just in the hallway, but I mean, as you can see, everything that is on here is what we do as adults on a daily basis, getting to work on time, making sure we have our tool belt, right, with our hammer, and being polite, everyone gives, receives respect, um, having a positive mental attitude, this is the one that I really try to drive home, being born and raised from Commerce City, being, uh, grew up at 7081 Newport Street, um, I know this is something that really needs to be hammered home to our kids, that yes, not all the time do we come from the best of circumstances at home, but there's ways to rise above that, and there's ways to be better and go about business and handle it, just like my dad did. He grew up in a house with nine brothers and sisters in a two-bedroom house, same house that I grew up in on 7081 Newport Street, and he has his master's degree in math, so it, it can be done. Um, and then participating um, and then producing quality work. And then um, in terms of the what teachers are looking for inside the classroom, um, it, it we're, we're something that we're still working on. It's kind of teaching the teachers because not everybody got to go to the training this summer. But we, we have these things got attending skills. Um, being in the moment, having appropriate body language, appropriate eye contact, appropriate feedback, and asking questions to clarify or validate. And these are, the, these are the things that are posted in all the rooms. All the kids have a class that me and Mr. Leggy um, kind of co-teach. And we teach them what these skills are. So that way we're not just saying, these are attending skills, go do it. No. They actually, um, one of the funnest things that I, that I do is make them actually be the teacher for the day. And I'm the student and I get to sit back and kind of mess around. And they have to call me out on my attending skills and go through the three redirects. And it's a good time. But it sets up the, the culture of what's going to the expectation is from classroom to classroom. So it's, it, it, I, I think it's slowly starting to come together to where it, it's understood what, what we expect from 8 a.m. to 3.39 p.m. inside the building. Sorry, I talk a lot. You can tell he's a day school guy because our school though is open till 8 o'clock. I feed him at 6. So <laughs> um, we let him off the hook a little bit. I had a child just yesterday come on and said, Mr. Sanders, you're being critical parent right now, and I need you to be more on the restorative justice side. I need you to help me help myself. So they're getting it. They're really getting it. Monica, could we? do we have our slideshow now? We put a PowerPoint together that we could share some of the wonderful things we're doing and um, sent it. Oh, okay, I'm sorry. I got ahead of myself, I'm sorry. Um, 
And one last thing before we do that, these folks just work so very hard. Um, we're, we're doing some amazing things at Lester Arnold. Thank you. We gotta take a picture. Picture. I know you guys will break the camera, but it's too bad. Is that it, Dr. Abrego? Yes, that's it. Okay, we will now move on to audience comments. Just a reminder, if, when you come up, present uh, with the audience, I want you to share some brief highlights. Uh, here again, state your name. You have three minutes to speak. All comments need to be district related. Your comments can uh, suggest improvements, but should be productive. You can provide written statements to the board for review. Uh, the president can recognize a board member or the superintendent to respond to questions to clarify a district's position. This time, Mr. Gedmo Serna. Guillermo Serna, 14122, East 102nd Place, Commerce City, Colorado. As, as we look at what's coming here in the near future, please don't go back 12 years ago. Some of the problems that were created at that time are still here with you. And you're doing the best you can. Be proud of that. Parents are going to have to participate more with their children. It's not just good for a principal to come up here and say, this is what we have to do. It's not just accountability, but it's participation. When you go to the state school board, find them accountable too because they were just as responsible for what happened in this district. From the commissioners to the state boards, they wouldn't respond to the needs of this district. And when you go, make sure when you go to the capital that you lobby for changes in how school districts are financed and how the money is spread out. It's not enough what is being provided to public education right now. And they'll f want to find us accountable for it, but it's them, that they won't stick together for the benefit of this state and provide the funds for it. We can try all we can by sitting up there. When we talk about a child that's supposed to be here, 
It's the parents. And it's the kids themselves and how much pride they bring with them. That child that sits there is also responsible for getting the elementaries to start participating in the children that are coming up so that they can fill that position. There's answers to everything. But the community has got to get together and bring this up. If one child out of seven graduates out of college, it's not enough because of what's coming. The challenges are going to be tremendous. When now we can, the way that they're studying, they'll be able to reach Mars in less than two weeks when it was going to be a year, let's say 20 years ago. There's something happening. It's a new revolution of the children and how they need to be educated. But we, as parents and a whole community, have got to take responsibility and also go speak for you at the state when you make presentations. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Sherman. Uh, next, we'll have Barb McDowell. Barb McDowell. Um, um, 303 Bridget Drive, North Glen, Colorado, 80260. Good evening, President Rolla, Dr. Abrego, distinguished members of the board. Um, tonight I'm speaking on behalf of the Classroom Teachers Association. I am coming tonight to express a concern that is impacting many of our students and their families. While this began as a political move at the executive branch, this is in no way political. In fact, we are faced not only with a moral obligation, but a legal one as well. There have been reports of immigration officials in cities around the country and including Commerce City. While immigration enforcement actions generally are not to occur at various sensitive locations such as schools, places of worship, and hospitals, our students and their families do not feel safe. Actions can occur at any time, but rely heavily on an element of surprise and most often occur at the individual's workplace in, or in or near their home such as apartment complexes or trailer parks. Some of the features of a raid include having a number of immigration and customs enforcement agents in uniforms or not and appear in large numbers. They may come with or without a warrant or an agent could give false or misleading information to gain access to a home and describe. Recently, apprehensions have targeted immigration, immigrant youth leaving their home on their way to school or work. If you haven't already heard, Families in some cities, such as Austin, Texas, have kept their children home from school in order to protect them. For some, this is just a political issue, but that is false. When we entered the teaching profession, we were given not only the authority, but also the duty to act in the place of the parents when disciplining and protecting the students in our care in local Perennis. Under tort principles of negligence, educators owe students a duty to anticipate foreseeable dangers and take reasonable steps to protect those students from that danger. That means we are obligated to ensure our students are protected. These fears of mass identification, detainment, and or deportation of immigrants in our community have had a harmful impact on our students. Behaviors and energy levels have risen. If our students' heads are not in the game, they are not learning. They are just simply going through the motions of surviving. The teaching staff in Adams 14 is phenomenal. They work every day to try and meet the, both the academic and emotional needs of our students. For many of us, it is not just a legal obligation, but a moral one. Not one of us can even begin to understand what children and their parents are going through on a daily basis. However, it is in our power and our responsibility to help protect our students and their families. It is for that reason I am here tonight. We have emergency plans for fire, tornado, physical danger inside and outside of our schools. This fear the families of Adams 14 are facing is real too. So we have an obligation to create an emergency plan to keep them safe. We need to work together to create a plan now rather than later. The Classroom Teacher Association would like to work together with the administration and the Board of Education to create this plan so we can create the schools, all of our students, including our immigrants, 
documented or undocumented, deserve. Okay, that is it for recognition, and I mean for audience comments. Moving on to superintendent's report, Dr. Abrego. Yes, we have uh, three superintendent reports. The first one is gonna be by Lester Arnold, and will be followed by Kearney Middle School, and then uh, a presentation on the Courage to Risk Conference. Thank you. Mr. President, esteemed board. Um, we picked a, a few highlights from our survey that we would like to share with you this evening. And while we're waiting for that one to come up, I'll special thanks to my wife for spending Valentine's Day with me. <laughs> it's a cheap date, man. <laughs> She's been with me forever, and no matter where I'm at, she <laughs> seems to come and help. You're asking me to use my eyeballs. No, wrong one. To the right. There we go. Some of the questions that they asked, have you been harassed or bullied on school property? We decreased by 17% to 16.3% reporting one incident last year. Has someone said bad things about you because you're white, says gender, or physical appearance? We decreased by 31%. It's amazing that, that these guys are doing that. Have you hit, punched, or kicked someone while on school property? We decreased to 18%, one incident last year. I feel safe at my school, 88.6% agreeing. I feel safe on my way home, 91.4%. How many days did you smoke cigarettes? It decreased six or 13% um, reporting one day in the last month. Has anyone offered, sold, or given you an illegal drug on school property? Decreased 15.8%. Yeah, we want them to read zero. We do. And we'll get there. We're pretty darn close. I'd prefer to date a non-smoker. I love that one. What did they say? Kids gave me a thing that said, uh, kissing a smoker is like licking a dirty ashtray. I love it. It was like, you got it. I'd prefer to date a non-drinker. I would prefer to date a non-drug user. 85% of our kids get it. There's at least one teacher or adult at this school with whom I can talk to if I have a problem. 80% agreeing. Now you gotta remember our turnover. We're, we're constantly bringing in kids from Autumn City High School, so we're constantly working on this. Talk to a therapist or counselor about problems with 41%, um, 44%. How important is it to finish high school? 93%, they know that, they're getting it. Personal well-being, I, I it should say I know how to, I'm not a very good typist, I know how to handle problems when they happen, 72% have that ability. I have high expectations and standards for success, an increase of 16% for 85%. Thank you. I think what, what we're doing with, with kids and teaching them how to be successful is huge. Mr. Rolla, as you alluded to at the DAC meeting, our culture and climate are huge for us. It's huge for our success. And we're very, very excited where we're going and what we're doing, and I'd like to thank those three people. Thank you. Next, we will have um, Kearney Middle School. President Rolla, Dr. Abrego, and the board. This is the unified improvement plan for Kearney Middle School for this school year. We've selected three, best first instruction, culture and climate, and educator effectiveness. Did you receive a copy of this last week? Yes. Okay, thank you. Along those lines, with culture and climate, we want to create a school climate for our staff and students that promotes excellence. So 
Um, we want motivation for our students. We want everybody believing that they can succeed. And we have staff that have created, um, we STARS pro test our students and progress monitor our students in both reading and math five times throughout the school year, whereas the district only requires three times. So we progress monitor more frequently. And then we have teachers that celebrate. So on the left, you see a silly string fight that for the students that made over 100 points of growth. We have teachers getting pied in the face. We have barbecues for students. We also, on the right side, have assemblies each semester for, or each quarter for students that have made excellent growth. And that includes most in, or highest growth in both language arts and math, the highest score, whether they have an honor, if they met the honor roll requirements of 3.0 GPA or higher, principal's honor roll, perfect attendance, are they at our school on a daily basis? And then also student and staff members um, uh, recogn recognition for uh, qu high quality characters. And then throughout our building, you can see that we post those students <coughs> that have been recognized and that those are images of both honor rolls and celebrating and also students that were recognized at the academic assemblies. Next, if you walk through Kearney Middle School, you'll see the student exemplars are on our bulletin boards. You'll see a lot of high quality student work that is going up. Uh, on the right, you'll see science, which is very, very difficult for our second language learners because of the academic language that it involves. So what they do is they take the assignment and they make an analogy. So when students put together uh, science projects, they have to make an analogy, like this is like starting a car. And then this is the way that the students remember their science. On the left, you see uh, student responses, again, of quality work. On, on this particular one, it's, she's asking for the transformation of our complex world, requires to be critical, independent, and reflective thinkers. They always have a rubric that goes along with any work they do, and that's their definitions of a rubric. They know what they have to do in order to get that high grade. The next slide is our data team meetings. We meet uh, every other week with our grade level teams with the analysis of STARS assessment results. As Mr. Selick mentioned earlier, we talk about student growth. I have the literacy reading master data board in my office and Mr. Selick has the math board in his office. There is a magnet on that board that has every student's name in the school on it and where they started in August with the first assessment. Uh, teachers at the end of every STAR uh, assessment come and move the magnet up going towards proficiency or grade level. We're now at a point, we started this last year, where students are wanting to come in and move their own magnet up. If you walk through Kearney, you could ask the kids where they're at what their score is and what they're trying to get, get to. Uh, there's differentiated student grouping uh, that leaves for reteach or concepts that students have missed according to the data. The park alignment, there's calibration of scoring based on park rubrics where teachers get together so that they all have an understanding of what good quality work is. What is a four? What is proficiency? What is advanced and what does it look like? And that's why we have to put that student work up so that students are cognizant of what quality work looks like. And the administration of park-related assessments, as Mr. Selick mentioned, aligning everything with those assessments. Uh, teachers this year have had to write student learning objectives, which are selected of grade level priority standards and progress monitoring. As I mentioned earlier in the year and last year, I was blessed to have an opportunity to undergo the relay program, which is data-driven instruction by Bambrick Santoyo. Kids are having student conversations among themselves now, and they themselves are setting their goals. And on the left, you'll see where the teacher has asked, what was your goal for this assessment? and how are you gonna to work to achieve that goal? Then they put in there, where do they wanna to get to, where do they have to go to, and by when, and what strategies are gonna be put in place for them to get there. Every classroom, whether it's PE, art, music, math, science, social studies, or literacy, 
the teacher has a student data board. That's what you see to the right. And every time they take an assessment, she marks up there what their growth was. So students are very well aware of what they need to get done. So this is a table that I created based off, our, off of our school performance framework from last year, which is how our school is rated by CDE. And just as we want our students to know how they are assessed based on rubrics, we need to do our due diligence and look at how are we assessed. And so this is based on academic achievement for both language arts and math. Within each of those contents, both language arts and math, you are, our student, we are giving scores um, for all students and then also scores for students of um, free and reduced eligible, minority students, or in students with disabilities. So as you can see, majority of our students do count multiple times against our school performance framework, and that is why we made it a priority, and you will see in the upcoming slides, to really provide professional development for our teachers that will support our staff so that they can better support our students with the English language, developing English as a second language. So as you can see, the all students, if we, Last year, based on the scale score, you can see for language arts, we got a scale score uh, average of 7, 19, and 9 tenths. We only missed the next category of approaching by 4.7 scale points. Within math for all students, we missed it by 4 tenths of a point. If we make those growths, we go from an improvement school to a, uh, to a performance school. And that's really where our focus is because we know that we have the staff and the students that are capable of doing that. Along with the school performance framework, we are also given a rating on growth. And once again, we have laid out and created a plan so that we can make the growth so that we can get back to the green. Another thing that we started doing that we wanted students to know every single class that they went into, what the objective was. What do I need to know before I leave this classroom in one hour? Uh, the content is what they need to know, the domain. There are four domains to the English language development, reading, writing, speaking, and listening, and the language functions with a success criteria. How am I, as the teacher, gonna know which students met my objective? Uh, and what we started doing was putting folders on the door that says, I understand what I did today, I almost got it, and I don't understand. And as they leave with that exit ticket, which is the exact same learning target and objective that the teacher posted, it's the same question that they must answer independently. So if you look at this sixth grade math, I can orally and in writing solve one-step equations by identifying the operation, determining the inverse operation, applying the inverse operation on a graphic organizer. The teacher will rephrase that like, do this. And students have to be able to show that they understood that before they left the classroom. One thing you'll note is this particular teacher that we got up from the elementary uh, started translating with Google Translate into Spanish for our ELLs. Now I've got a lot of teachers that are writing their academic language and their content language objectives in both languages. Differentiated professional development. What we're doing to meet our UIP, because we're so close to going green, is we're doing constructing meaning. By the end of this year, all my staff would have been trained in constructing meaning, which is a writing template that students are given strategies on how to become better writers. Uh, we have teamed up with CU with CSR, Collaborative Strategic Reading, that should be reading right there, uh, in the humanities and science, because like I mentioned earlier, science and social studies, they can't visualize that academic language. They don't know what a photosynthesis looks like. So we have these templates they, that uh, work hand in hand to help our second language learners. Accelerated math and gizmos that the district is doing. Um, collaborative strategic reading teaches students how to decipher that academic language and click and clunk it. Uh, then they go to the main idea, which is the gist, and they use contextual clues. In, a, in other words, instead of going straight to the dictionary to look up a word, they see if they recognize any part of the word first, and then they read the first part right before that word and what comes after it, and then they try to guess what the word means and then they could ask someone in their group. It's a lot of student-on-student -student work. 
uh, them working together to figure it out and the teacher just facilitating, not so much giving them the answers. I invite all of you to come by and see what that looks like. As Ms. G.J. B, Ms. B. J. mentioned as well, we also have all of our staff trained on constructing meaning by the end of the school year. And as you can see, what is highlighted in pink is it, or the picture on the right, what's written is a student example. The, what is highlighted in pink is the mortar. So that's really what is provided through the constructing meeting, and that allows the student then to be able to communicate effectively the academic language. So this is helping students, and we know that within park and scoring, they have to be able to justify and reason throughout that assessment to be able to reach proficiency. So this is one of the way that it's not only, it's not only uh, helpful for our ELLs, but it's also helpful for all students to be able to communicate and write effectively about the academic language. How, what does that look like in class? This is what a typical classroom looks like in our, in our building, where as you can see the lightest, scent, uh, lightest shaded color near, the, near 12 o'clock, um, that's a warm up. That's, that's a way to assess students' background knowledge. That next section moving clockwise is direct instruction, followed by guided practice. And that guided practice, this is students, again, communicating and working, and it's another chance for a teacher to assess students. And then that large piece of the pie on the left-hand side rep is, represents independent co or collaborative work by students, followed by, once again, as Ms. BJ mentioned, an exit ticket, which checks to see if students met your learning objective for the day. So as I kind of like how their color scheme builds on each other because the lesson builds on each other. And you can see that within this model, there's up to at least four times that we can assess student understanding to make sure that they are meeting our objective of the day. So once again, we really are focused on culture and climate and creating systems and structures that make students, A, want to come to school, be motivated to succeed, have the belief they can succeed, but then we also have the support and professional development to help our teachers support our students so that they can make sure our students succeed. Thank you. Any questions? Yes, I want to say I want to thank you both for what you're doing in the district and especially what you do for Kearney. But my question is, just briefly, could you explain what do your counselors do for the students? Yes, sir. Each counselor, our eighth grade counselor teaches web, which is a program where everybody belongs, where they select 65 students. There's a criteria for that. Those web leaders, they're eighth grade, they welcome our sixth graders when they come in. They help them open their lockers and with anything they need throughout the year. So the eighth grade has that. She also handles the transitioning from eighth grade to high school. Uh, last year, uh, they wrote a grant and we were able to get two counselors off of a grant or pick up another counselor off of the grant. So. The, in collaboration with our staff at Kearney, our teachers, they wanted to see one counselor at each grade level. We have about 270 kids at each grade level. They're constantly pulling kids. Uh, when they, there's a drop box that I need to speak to you in reference to this, they're doing threat assessments. Uh, my seventh grade counselor is getting ready to take a group of, I believe, 30 students to CSU. Um, another one is running, uh, the sixth grade is meeting with the fifth grade elementaries and transitioning the fifth graders up to Kearney Middle School. So they're constantly, uh, this year I had them start tracking every time they met with somebody. So every time someone comes in the counselor center, uh, they have to check in and check out and, and document the time they spent with each student. Right now they're probably getting about close to 60 to 70 students that go through their doors every day. In addition, not only do they support the social and emotional needs of our students, but they also have the academic conversations with our students. So checking their grades, checking their homework, mm -hmm. checking their progress so that we can make sure that they're on track as well. Thank you. And making a lot of phone calls home. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Any other good no, I, I would just like to make a comment, just say thank you very much because the most important thing that we want as superintendent of the board and everyone here is to have our schools be at that performance level. That's very important. So you've indicated that you have a plan and a timeline yes, on when you're going to get there. And what I heard you say is that you're very close and hopefully you'll be at that level within a year or two? At the most. Good. Thank you. And the, the teachers, the presentation, the slide that we shared where we're 0.4 away and 4.7, 
uh, on that flexible grouping, we've taken those cusp kids and given them a second dose of that, and they know that they are the ones that have to push this school over, not the adults, into the green. But those slides were presented to all the students in their classrooms. Well, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. And we do have one more presentation uh, from the individuals that went to the Courage to Risk Conference. Yeah. Uh, good evening, President Rolla, Vice President Quintana, uh, Superintendent Abrego, and distinguished members of the board. Uh, first and foremost, we want to thank you guys for giving us the opportunity to attend the Courage to Risk conference down in Colorado Springs. Courage to Risk is one of the largest uh, special education conferences for our state. Um, and tonight, we'd like to share with you some of the highlights from our trip. My name is Tracy Nix. I'm one of the special education coordinators. Um, one of the uh, workshops that I attended at Courage to Risk was a three-hour um, workshop on identifying uh, symptoms of autism in the educational environment. So some of our students uh, display symptoms of autism, but they don't have that medical diagnosis because it's hard for them to get access to that medical care. We are responsible for identifying what that looks like in an educational environment and providing special education services if they meet the eligibility requirements. Um, so one of, a few of the things that was highlighted by CDE at that presentation was um, some checklists that are specific to students who are higher functioning who have autism. Many people can recognize people with autism who look like Rain Man. However, we have a whole spectrum of students and we need to be better at identifying those kids that are higher functioning on that spectrum that might not stick out as having autism. Um, so they shared with us a bunch of information about the checklist that we can use to do a better job of identifying those students. Um, we want to have Brooke Carlson from CDE come in and do some training with all of our special education teams so that we're all very well versed in what autism looks like in students all the way across the spectrum so that we can make sure that we are meeting all of those students' needs. Um, and we also want to create a process um, for teams to reach out to a group of district level experts so when they say hey I have this fourth grader that I think might be eligible for special ed under autism but I don't know how to do that that they can contact us and we can come in and help them with that process so that we can make sure that we're following all the legal requirements um, and that we get the uh, services to provide that free and appropriate public education. And my name is Ashley McKnight. I'm a special <coughs> education teacher at Central Elementary. And the session that I went to was a three hour workshop on different study skills. And there are six main multi sensory strategies that they discussed. Uh, the first one is called Pindar's List. And this is a mnemonic strategy for sequencing chronological events. So it's really good for working with kids doing timelines or different numbers. Um, the next one was the connect, collect, correct, and this is a spin on a KWL chart, know, want to know, learned, and in this case they collect or connect to background knowledge, they collect new information, and then they correct any misconceptions that they may have had. The next one was preview, question, read, summarize, and test. And this is a great strategy when students are doing reading passages with questions when taking a test. So they're able to um, just do a quick preview or book walk, look at the questions at the end, um, read the passage, summarize the passage, and then do the test. The next one was read, cover, say, and check, where students um, read a passage, then cover it up and retell it to someone and then check their answers. Another strategy was 25-5. This one, they would study for 20 minutes, take a movement break for five minutes, go walk around, have a mental break, and then come back for five minutes to review what they've already practiced. And this is really good for distributing practice and um, increasing retention. And then the last one was the math key bank. This is just a study folder where there's pockets where kids throughout a unit can keep um, vocabulary, different key terms, important things that they learned along the way. 
and I'm hoping to use all these strategies in my classroom and so students can um, increase their uh, memorization and retention of information. And again, thank you for this opportunity to go to the conference. My name is Sari Saperstein and I'm a special education coordinator. Um, on behalf of John Hicks, our uh, preschool coordinator, um, I'm sharing something that he learned from educating the early learner with special needs um, session. And basically at that session, he was able to take away some interventions that included replacement skills, visual communication strategies, social stories, and a list of planning resources. And that's something that um, have been collected and he will be delivering them to professional development opportunities with preschool. And I believe that will be in smaller group settings, not on February 24th. However, the, the next three um, keynote and workshops that he attended will be shared on February 24th. So I'll quickly review those. Um, the next one is from Christy Kachetstan, um, and it was basically talking about the research that when students are um, in general education more than outside of general education, they perform better. Um, and so basically using hold ups, whereas, which is where students hold up whiteboards to show their answers, opposed to um, the teacher calls on one student and one student only. Um, and the next one focused around music to manage mood. So that brings in a lot of the mindfulness work that we're starting to bring into our schools now. Um, and he is planning on bringing music into the PD in August um, and kind of bringing that into how what we do in preschool every day. Um, and the last piece was about the IQIEC, the Indicators of Quality Inclusion for Early Childhood. Um, and we are helping to refine our preschool's inclusion model and plan a continuum of service. So that will also be brought to the preschool staff. Thank you for that part. Uh, my name is Matt Palero. I'm also a special ed coordinator. And one of the highlights of the, my experience was the session on adapting books for diverse learners. So first, it's important to know what an adapted book is. So an adapted book is any book that has been modified in some way that makes it more ex accessible to a student who has difficulty with typical books. Um, so what are some ways to adapt books? Well, books can be adapted in a variety of ways and for a vari <clears throat> variety of different reasons. With your permission, I'd like to approach the dais to share an example. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So in your hands, you have a book, uh, Hatchet, which is a fourth grade level text. This is an adapted version of chapter three of Hatchet that's been adapted for complexity to support a student with significant support needs who has a cognitive disability. So he too can still access the same content and theme that the general education classroom is learning about, um, just in a different way. Other way books can be adapted, books can be adapted for physical access. So if you are a student who has difficulty uh, with fine motor development and could not physically turn pages in a book. You can see in these examples, uh, this, these books have been adapted with popsicle sticks and page puffers to allow the student to grab onto the popsicle stick to turn the page or to get their fingers in between the pages with the page puffers that the space creates. Um, other ways you can adapt books is by presentation, so providing books in audio format, and large text, um, different color contrast, and even in braille. Other ways of adapting books include engagement and interaction, readability and abil ability level, learning style and understanding. Um, so some next steps for us um, that I would like to bring to the district along with my team is providing instructions and ideas for teachers and staff on how to adapt books they already have in their classrooms for students who have diverse learning needs. Um, also exploring different types of assistive, assistive technologies that we could bring to the district to enhance access to text and then our overall go goal of making uh, reading accessible for all kids. Okay, so I attended um, a conference called Put Me In Coach and it was put on by Chrissy Casa who is a PhD at CU. Um, and the most exciting piece about this was that it stood out to me more than any other presentation out there because it affects 
our classrooms on a daily basis. And we're actually going to be having Chrissy Casa come on January 24th to present the same presentation as a piece um, of what will be presented to paraprofessionals during that professional development opportunity. So um, just to give you some highlights, in the corner you're gonna see a cartoon and it says, I feel like I'm being followed. And the other person says, you're just being paranoid. And at the bottom of the caption says, the shadow knows Rodney's suspicions were accurate. Unbeknownst to him, a paraprofessional had been assigned to be his shadow. Um, and so that just enlightens a little bit of humor on the fact that sometimes when we assign paraprofessionals to students, um, it actually limits them more than it um, helps them. So um, basically this presentation was all about how we can include fading supports to paraprofessionals so that students can be more independent. Um, so some of the strategies for teachers as well as paraprofessionals were to call on students with a disability every class period. Um, all students should be accessing the grade level general education curriculum, kind of like Matt Palero said, um, accessing books um, with adapted text. Um, spread students throughout the classroom and use at least five different engagement, strategy, engagement strategies every hour, as well as teaching the paraprofessional to float, not just stick with one student. So this not only applies to special education paraprofessionals, but um, instructional paraprofessionals across our district as well. And then the other strategies that I found would be helpful to bring back, which we will also cover on February 24th, are to make everything visual. When directions are only provided auditorily, students do not grasp onto those concepts, especially students with special needs. Um, providing lots of choice, focus on fading, and have accommodations and modifications ready to go. Um, so these are all things that we're going to be helping train our paraprofessionals on to support um, and increase independence in all of our students. My name is Kim Harone and I'm the Assistant Director of Student Services. Um, I tracked mostly during this conference on trauma-informed practices and my focus in this area is because I directly supervise mental health providers for the district. So that's all of our school so social workers and school psychologists. Um, really wanted to get the current research and practice and standards that are happening across the state of Colorado and even nationally on how we are engaging students in the classroom. Um, we have already started doing trauma-informed practices for our mental health providers. We've done three different modules with Community Reach Center of Colorado, or Community Reach Center, Adams County. Um, in two weeks, four of us are gonna go off to Aurora and train with Project AWARE on mental, will be, become mental health first aid trainer of trainers and bring that back to the district and be training all of our staff as we enter into the new school year, including deans, guidance counselors, paraprofessionals, and teachers. Um, and then I was also able to obtain a bibliography of trauma-related practices that we can start to embed um, this type of content through literature. Questions for any of us? Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Is that it, Dr. Abrego? Yes, that's it. We had the three okay. presentations. Moving on to routine items. Consent items, uh, personnel. Uh, superintendent's recommendation. I need a motion for personnel action. So moved. Second. Is there any discussion? Yes. <clears throat> On here, it looks appears that we have a uh, coordinator that was hired, I believe, at part time, and the salary is $104,793 prorated annually. Um, I'd like to get the justification why we hired this person uh, when we're trying to reduce staff and salaries. Um, doesn't make much sense to me. And uh, President Rule, I'm not quite sure the question but 
are we allowed to discuss personnel uh, here, or is this have you, to be? Yes, as long as you don't mention names. Okay. Then I'll, I'll have our HR department help us with that. So the position that you're referring to is a point five individual that's working a point five. So she began in January, and she'll be so that's half of the school year, and then she's working half of the day. So really, the amount ends up being twenty five thousand around that uh, for January through June. The placement on the salary schedule is based on full-time job-related experience on that salary schedule to honor the individual's knowledge and experience in that category. But it's not showing, it's just saying prorated, but it's not breaking it down step by step what we need to see. What I like to see myself as a point five is still showing the 104. Right, so would you like in parentheses, because we're just giving the cell that's in that range well, and that column, um, and so are you asking for, in parentheses, this is the remaining amount for the year? Yes, plus it's, it's act, actually it's written in, it's not in the cell. Right, you mean just the dollar amount is, it doesn't written say in. range this, step that. It's a that range step, then it got a number. Normally, right. normally in the sale, it have direct number, but this is look like it was just written in and prorated in our packet. Typed in or written in? Written in. So are, is that, it, just to be clear, so that we're sure that we're providing the information that the board would like, did you want, if it is a .5 of a .5, the remaining amount for the year? Is that what, I just want to be clear so that we're providing the accurate information for you all to know, so it provides yes. more clarity to you. But I think what you're saying is that 104000 mm -hmm. if it, so I'm assuming she'll be, he or she will be back in July. That 104 is from July till. Uh, Actually, if, if it remains a 0.5 person, uh, I believe that's the only uh, FTE allotted for that position. If they come back for next year and they were a 0.5, it would be half of the 104. Okay, so that's what I think they're saying is they don't want to see the that as if it was an FTE. Right, you don't want to now, okay, so you don't want to see the entire salary amount. You want to see the actual amount remaining that would be paid to the individual, okay. not the amount that's in the cell that they're actually, you know, that's displayed on the salary schedule. It, this position, was it a vacant position that was filled? It was a TAP, um, like last year. Um, it's, I really can't give a lot of detail without. Sure. Yeah. You can just say yes or no. I mean, so it it was approved okay. and um, it was available and just recently hired. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? Okay, can I have roll call, Monica? Aye. 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 Moving on to business policy one point one. Superintendent's recommendation, I need a motion to accept policy FF and FF-R, dash revised, second reading adoption, naming a facility. So moved. Second. Is there any discussion? Hearing none, can we have a roll call, Monica? Mr. Aye. 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 Moving on to 1.2, superintendent's recommendation. I need a motion for 
policy FF-E-New, second reading, adoption, naming a facility committee input survey. So moved. Second. Is there any discussion? Hearing none, can I have roll call, Monica? Mr. Aye. Mr. Aye. 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 Moving on to grants, 2.1, superintendent's recommendation. I need a motion for the approval to accept $20,000 from the Climb Higher Colorado Grant Rose Foundation to support academic partnership between schools and family. So moved. Second. Is there any discussion? Hearing none, can we have roll call, Monica? Mr. Aye. Mr. Aye. 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 Mr. Aye. Aye. Moving on to 2.2, superintendent's recommendation. I need a motion for the approval to apply for AIM High Grant from New York Life Foundation. So moved. Second. Any discussion? Hearing none, can we have roll call, Monica? Mr. Aye. 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 Moving on to 2.3, superintendent's recommendation. I need a motion for approval to apply for di diagnostic review grant from the Colorado Department of Education. So moved. Second. Is there any discussion? Yes. I just want to say um, since Ms. Burke took the position, it's the first time since I've been on this board that I have seen close to four grants approved, applied for in, a, in our session. So I thank you for taking that position. Thank you. Okay. Any other discussion? Hearing none, can we have roll call, Monica? Mr. Aye. 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 Moving on, 2.4, superintendent's recommendation. I needed a, uh, a motion for the approval to apply for early literacy program grant from the Colorado Department of Education. So moved. Second. Is there a discussion? Hearing none, can I have roll call? Aye. Excuse me. Aye. <laughs> Aye. 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 Moving on, 2.5, superintendent's recommendation. <clears throat> I need a motion for the approval to apply school turnaround leader Leaders Development Program Grant from the Colorado Department of Education. So moved. Second. Is there any discussion? Hearing none, can we have roll call, Monica? Mr. Aye. 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 Moving on, 2.6, superintendent's recommendation. I need a motion for the approval to apply for turnaround network, network <laughs> Grant from the Colorado Department of Education. So moved. Second. Is there any discussion? Hearing none, can I have roll call, Monica? Mr. Aye. 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 Moving on to other 3.0, 3.1 super, superintendent's recommendation. I need a motion for the approval for out of state travel to Orlando, Florida for commission on adult basic education conference from April 2nd to 5th, 2017. So moved. Second. Is there any discussion? Hearing none, grab roll call, Monica. Aye. 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 Moving on, 3.2, superintendent's recommendation. I need a motion for Approval for out-of-state travel to Seattle, Washington for the annual Teacher of English to, to Speakers of Other Language Conferences from March 21st to 24th, 2017. So moved. Second. Is there any discussion? <coughs> Hearing none, can we have roll call, Monica? Mr. Aye. 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 Moving on to 3.3, superintendent's recommendation. <clears throat> I need a motion for the approval to renew the Adams 14 contract with Don Johnston for Cole Ryder. So moved. Second. Is there any discussion? 
Hearing none, can we have roll call, Monica? Mr. President? Aye. Mr. President? Aye. Mr. President? Aye. Mr. Aye. Aye. Moving on, 3.4, superintendent's recommendation. I need a motion for the approval for learning services to use funds for food and beverages. So moved. Second. Any discussion? Hearing none, can we have roll call, Monica? Mr. Aye. Mr. Aye. 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 Moving on to 3.5, superintendent's recommendation. I need a motion for the approval of auctioning inoperable service vehicles. So moved. Second. Is there any discussion? Hearing none, can we have roll call, Monica? Aye. 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 Moving on to 3.6, superintendent's recommendation. I need a motion for the approval of ironwood earth care for district tree pruning and removal. So moved. Second. Is there a discussion? Yes. I'm trying to figure out the $16,482, Mr. Weber. Uh, why is it coming out the capital reserves funds? Because uh, that's the <clears throat> funding that is available to have this service done. Um, that is part of the plan to continue um, removing the uh, life safety issues that are uh, throughout <coughs> the district. Okay. And the question, last year, April the 6th, you gave the board a presentation And as you see, you did not add that to the um, projects that was approved for 2016-17. That is correct. Um, what we had done is use some of the asphalt uh, and carryovers from some of the projects that didn't have their uh, full funding sources needed. So we took those funds to um, address the uh, current needs of the uh, uh, district um, tree assessment that was done by the risk manager and the grounds department. And so uh, needing those, uh, trying to meet those needs in an immediate uh, need, we took those cap reserve funding to uh, address those issues. So if I ask that the projects that was approved for 2016 was $1.1 $1 million, did the district wide the best this get done, the 20,000? I apologize, could you repeat that, sir? The, the projects that was approved for 2016 and 17, I'm gonna go down the list and ask you were they done or not done. Okay. Was the district wide asbestos 20,000, was that done? Um, for what's been on the uh, books to address, yes. And the district wide asked about 100,000. Uh, the current needs um, that had been met was the parking lot here at the ESS. Um, we have two other projects that are uh, encumbered in those funds for a parking lot at uh, Kearney Middle School and a couple patches at um, some other locations to address the uh, asphalt issues there. So it's no? Um, I would say that there is 30. I want to say 70, roughly 70,000 uh, dedicated to address the uh, concrete and asphalt needs uh, currently through the district. Uh, some of those projects, the asphalt couldn't be laid because the temperatures changed. Um, so as soon as the temperatures get above 60 where the, uh, uh, we're not in a freezing condition, they'll be uh, putting asphalt back down. And the district-wide paying the 25,000? Uh, no, that, that has not started yet. Um, and those are funds that are allocated to address um, asset protection such as doorways, internal painting. Um, a lot of this is gonna be addressing some uh, internal damage over at Kearney Middle School where we've had roof leaks and walls bubbling. And so those, those funds are dedicated to address those uh, current needs. So the painting you're saying is gonna be done to do something else? 
No, it, it, it is dedicated to address the uh, drywall and painting issues at uh, Kearney Middle School and a couple other small projects. Uh, the high school has some needs as well. And what about the district um, roof replacement, 591000 Yes, those, those have been met. Um, that was the uh, Kemp um, Elementary School and DuPont Elementary School roof projects. And the district-wide glass of 4900 That is uh, based on vandalism needs and then a couple um, issues that we had with the uh, current um, plexiglass that was uh, scratched up and vandalized so bad that we couldn't see through it anymore and had the uh, windows replaced, so yes. So the whole 49 is gone? Yeah, I'm certain it's pretty well depleted. And the district-wide plumbing of 191000 the district-wide plumbing of 191,000. Um, I'm not certain. Some of this funding was carried over from the Adams City Middle School main sewer replacement. Um, the current cap reserve funding that I had was at 75,000. Um, we are currently addressing the uh, water uh, softeners. Um, we just did a uh, district-wide lead test, um, which um, came back um, positive for the school district. And then we have um, some dish. Uh, uh, excuse me. Uh, hot water heaters that um, we're assessing right now for summertime replacement. So um, I'm confused. So yes, the 191,000 has been used? Um, uh, no, there's not. A whole, the total of 191,000 has not been uh, completely used. And you got custodial equipment is 11,000. Has that been used? Yes, sir. I believe there's roughly um, $4,000 left of that amount. And you got grounds equipment of 75000 Yes, sir. That was the uh, new uh, wide area mower that you uh, agreed to uh, purchase for the uh, district. If I'm not mistaken, that white, that lawnmower was, um, I have to go through the minutes of somebody, that lawnmower was purchased for 63000 and it was purchased through the general fund. It wasn't, it wasn't on this. That lawnmower was a totally separate. Was it? Okay, then um, th then those current uh, grounds equipment needs would be um, the snow blowers, snow plows. Um, I would have to look through um, the actual uh, allocations for those out of the cap reserve. So the 70,000, 75,000 is a no too, right? Um, the, the, those numbers, when we do a cap reserve, they're, they're uh, dedicated to each of those departments um, based on those needs. So those allocations are, are put in place for a plan to expend um, those totals. I believe um, that 75,000 was out of that current uh, cap reserve allocation for um, that mower, sir. Uh, we'll look into that. What about the district locks, please? Fifty thousand. That is currently in place. Um, the district's about halfway done now with the um, card access entry, and we are currently um, working on a um, locks and hardware uh, cap reserve project um, that isn't listed on here yet. Um, and this was uh, for a uh, CED and. Um, ADA compliant um, lever action for all the schools. My next question would be to um, Dr. Brego. Could you look into all this for us, please? And yes. Get, and get back with the board, please. I'm I'm done with questions. We uh, missed one, and that was the security cameras, 120,000. Yeah, the district-wide security cameras um, have been purchased for uh, the projects. There are probably four um, locations that have been completed. Um, in, that, in the time of this, we've had a uh, resignation, and so therefore we're, you know, with one individual trying to do two projects. So um, we're planning on uh, interviews tomorrow for some additional help so we can continue to uh, do a lot of these projects internally. Um, which helps save the district funding. But the cameras and the uh, uh, DVRs have been purchased and they are stored at the uh, district warehouse ready for installation. 
but we took the areas that had uh, limited or no um, security camera systems in place and had those put in place. Uh, that was a top priority. Mr. Thompson, if you could give me a, a clarification of what you're looking for in the allocation so that I can make sure that I provide that. Uh, I'd like for Dr. Brago to make sure to look for each individual item that has a dollar amount, and we would like to see the transactions that each one of those individual amount that you um, that was allocated to your department. Uh, that was approved, we like to see um, the dollar amount and the receipts in. And I'm sure some of these things should have had a, a RFP to go out with them too, right? Absolutely. Um, they did. And then um, some of those funds with, like I said, with the carryover to address some of the issues that come about that are unforeseen um, to address, uh, such as the uh, um, tree removal and, and trying to get those things uh, addressed in a timely manner. Any other questions? Can I have a roll call, Monica? Mr. Aye. 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 No. Okay, moving on to 3.7, superintendent's recommendation. I need a motion for the approval to renew maintenance agreement for general ledger and human resource system with Tyler Technology, LLC. So moved. Second. Is there a discussion? Hearing none, could I have roll call, Monica? Aye. 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 We're on 3.8, superintendent's recommendation. I need a motion for the approval for renewal of memorandum of understanding with Cronkey Stadium Services. So moved. Second. Discussion. Hearing none, could I have roll call, Monica? Mr. Aye. 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 Moving on, 3.9, superintendent's recommendation. I need a motion for the approval of Vin State Overnight Travel for Student Leadership Organization, FBLA State Conference from April 14th through 16th, 2017. So moved. Second. Is there any discussion? Where, does anybody know where the conference is being held? Avon. Oh, Avon, is it on there or something? Yes. It was moved from Vail to Avon just this week, so. Okay, thank you. Yep. Any other discussion? Hearing none, can we have a roll call, Monica? Mr. Aye. 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 Uh, moving on to 3.10, superintendent's recommendation. I need a motion for the approval to accept ED belly payroll examined, exemption. So moved. Second. Is there a discussion? Here now, grab roll call, Monica. Aye. 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 Moving on to 4.0 discussion. 4.1, uh, restroom for transportation department. Mr. Thomas, that was yours, wasn't it? Yes. Um, the board approved that one thousand, that one million forty-eight thousand two hundred forty-five dollars, and the one million was set aside to go for the innovation plan for the Chrome computers and the BK books. Is that correct, Dr. Brago? Yes. And that left $48,245. Um, as we know, last week uh, we had an ice storm, and the department, transportation department, has to go out that out they building to the building next door or the buildings there to use the bathroom because they're not fortunate to have a bathroom in the facility. I'm asking that we put $25,000 of that 48000 to have a bathroom installed in that transportation department. Um, 
Board Member Thomas, you know, with, I'm working diligently with all staff uh, to get our budget organized and balanced. So I'm um, meeting with the uh, maintenance department, but I don't know if we will have those funds, and I don't know if the 48000 will even cover that. I did uh, speak with um, some of my staff about the possibility of trying to get that done, but I think that if you want us to look into it, it's going to be more costly than that. I'm looking at about 150000 but I do want to let you know, Mr. Thomas, too, that when we allocate funds from one area to another that we are taking, so if you want to get something like this done, I'm going to have to meet with my staff and see where we're going to be able to reduce that 48000 or whatever funds that the board decides to allocate. And if you go as high as the 150, we we're talking about possibly having to balance our budget by letting people go, which would be probably some certified staff or classified staff in order to get this done. Um, correct me if I'm wrong, Dr. Brager, with the $1,048,000 was access money that the board allocate $1 million to go towards the BK. So that did leave 48000 sitting there but, on the uh, side. We did not allocate that 48000 to nothing. I, I, if I am correct, we had $0 in our curriculum and instruction budget. And my understanding was our focus and our goals were going to be on academics, we're going to be on technology, and improving the culture. So our funds, I, to my understanding, was to address our goals. But once again, it's, it's something that the board had to decide when you are asking me to work with all the departments and prioritize our needs, and I'm trusting my department heads to do that. And then when we come up here and say we're shifting that, then it, it makes it very difficult for my staff and my finance person to balance the budget. Okay. Remember that all the money we have, I mean, it, it's, 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 we're trying to prioritize our needs and spend the money as wisely as possible to get us to where we want to go, and that is basically improving all of our schools. So we're meeting, we're doing that, and again, the money that was allocated, I, it was my understanding that it was gonna be for curriculum and instruction and technology which is one of our goals. And that is true, but you did ask for just $1 million to start, and that wasn't even contemplating next, next, next year's budget. It, yes, and, and again, uh, what, what I asked for, but, but my responsibility as superintendent is to make sure that I present a balanced budget to you when I come in two or three months. So that is what I'm doing with my staff right now, and that is what we want to do. So again, all the monies that we have in our budget is going to be allocated for one thing or another. Um, I would like for you or the board to consider looking into a bathroom for transportation because those ladies that work in there has to walk into another building. There was a snowstorm last month and we had no school. So I'm asking this board to look into bathroom for transportation. They don't have one. They have to go into another building. I can address that. Um, I did get an email in regards to this uh, request here just a couple of days ago. Um, they did look into it. They had an architect come over and uh, give some preliminary um, ideas on what they could do with that uh, facility. Um, but that did not include um, construction costs. So um, to, to be more accurate with what the need was in, in that space. Now, I know that facility has been um, that way for a number of years. And so um, their, their access to that restroom um, in that building has um, not been limited to, to any time of the day for them. Can you provide this board that email? I can. Okay. Okay, I guess to save time, can you just get a, give us a information on what it would cost to set up that restroom? Absolutely, I'll get okay. a, and a then we estimated can act construction on it. cost. Um, also just, you know, 
want to just bring to light here that I also presented that the district has roughly $86 million in deficit and deficiencies throughout all our facilities. So there's a lot of um, competition in what needs to be done in a timely manner, including roofs, sidewalks, uh, restroom rebuilds, um, ADA compliant asbestos. So I just want to, you know, make sure that when we put our cap reserve dollar, we're trying to take care of the life safety issues first within our student body and then move outside of that. Um, and, and obviously we're in battle with the uh, curriculum dollars as well and trying to meet those needs. Any other discussion? Okay, so we'll try to, I hopefully they give us a bid on what, what it's gonna cost. That's what we gotta know, right? Yeah. Okay, moving on to communications. Uh, we have been presented for an out of service RFP process. They would like us to be involved, or do we want to be involved in the audit as a board? And that was the handout that it was the additional handout that was given to us. Is this an audit or is this a? It is an audit, yeah. This is the Friday update that came it, out. Oh. Every five years, I think we have to, a new, uh, we have to either choose a company to. Yeah, yeah, I think it's a new company. We're looking yeah. to see if we want to change companies. Am I correct? Right, our current agreement with the current audit firm expired and then we did the one year extension <clears throat> last year and so now we have no current agreement and we need to do the RFP to pick who our new firm will be. Do we want to? I, I would like to be a part of it. Well, okay, yeah, but do we, as a board, as a, do we want? Oh. We want to send it out. I prefer we send it out. Send it out? Okay, do, do we have consensus to send it out? Yes, okay. Now the next question would be if we send it out, <coughs> we need one or two board members to be able to work on that. Connie said she would, right? Yes, because I was on it before when we picked this one. Is there anyone else that would like to be part of that? I will. Joe? Okay, so you have those two. Uh, okay, thanks, Ed. All uh, right, for uh, another thing on communications. Uh, I'll just catch you afterwards with some dates. For communications, just like to say that uh, I attended uh, some of the athletics here last week and uh, the kids were really involved in it. And they had a great uh, senior night for the girls on uh, Tuesday, uh, Friday, I believe, and it was jam packed. The other thing for communication, I would like to congratulate Mr. Thomas for being elected co-chairman for the Democratic uh, Party of, of Adams County. So once again, let's give him a hand. Congratulations. <laughs> Does anybody else have anything for communications? I Dr. Abrego? Joe. Um, I spoke with the mayor here uh, last week, and he's offered um, city council and two of our board members to form a commission to discuss and address concerns with our schools within the city limits and I think it's a great idea that two of us meet with two of their council people and we can sit down to address issues especially like at Central and uh, they are willing to work with us on all levels so I'm asking if we can have two board members. You want to members. add about the possibility of dog track if we're involved in that, what could yeah. happen? Um, we had further discussions that the development of the dog track may not happen and the city may end up selling the property. We did have a brief discussion about the district being interested in that property and that was about the extent of it. Uh, the city is open to that idea, and um, I took away that we probably would get first uh, denial of that property if it went, if the city decided that way. I think it would be a wonderful opportunity for us to look at um, that land, I think it's about 45, 46 acres uh, for future um, 
future building for our schools. So with that, um, I would like to get a hold of the mayor and give him an answer of what we'd like to do as a board. Is there two people? I know, you want to, I know, Joe, right? Yeah, I do. Is there someone else that wants to be part of that? Uh, sure, I'll be part of it. I sit on the URD board already. Okay, so you two would just continue to... Okay, I'll get a hold of the, the mayor and get that worked out. Yeah. And, and probably that'll probably uh, be brought up on Friday when we meet with the county and the city commissioners and the city council people and stuff. So yeah, I will get a hold of him uh, tomorrow. Okay. Um, my second item is, is for Gianni. And um, can you give us a brief, a brief update on our Eagle and where, what process, where we're at of that? I have not stopped at the high school to see where Mr. Cerna is on that. I can do that okay. this week and check on okay. it. What I heard is he is, uh, I don't know if you remember, that one of the wings was busted. Correct. He got the wing uh, welded to his next process. He's kind of going to nib it off a little bit, still keep the rust spot yeah. that you want it, and then put it uh, clear. But his thinking was, and so was I, once they get all that down, that thing is heavy. So how are you going to secure that? Are you going, you're going to have to look on securing, because my understanding is when it was at the old school, it went down into the ground and then they cemented it in, and then we they took a torch to it and cut it. So I don't know if we have to extend that. So I don't know. That was his main concern also was how oh, how they're going to secure that because it is one heavy dude. I mean, it took a yeah, forklift to lift it. Absolutely, and what I'll do is I'll get out there and get with the uh, shop teacher to um, see what base is on there and then have a structural engineer make sure that we provide the appropriate fastening um, and then mount that um, in its location. Um, again, I may um, I have a, a call in to the state to identify there are some sculptures and things, however they're mounted on school district property because their state um, property may have to go through a permit <coughs> phase so th that structural engineer will help us uh, meet those needs so that we can get that uh, installed properly <coughs> and safely thank you and another question for Johnny yep. um, do we have a lacrosse club here in the district we have a club yes at the high school is that sanctioned by the district it's a club so it would be sanctioned by the district yes by the school I uh, received some sterling information last week that our athletic director bought equipment for this lacrosse club. Can you confirm or deny that? I cannot confirm or deny. I can look into it though. Um, if I'm correct, and you may correct me if, if I'm incorrect, I don't believe we can use our funds to buy equipment for a club. That's not sanctioned, is that correct? Well, it depends where the funds come from. If the kids raised them and it was a 74 account, then you could. Yes. So I'd have to look into that where those funds came from. Okay. Can you do that and get with Dr. Abrego and send the board some info on that? Yeah, absolutely. Because I, what I've been told, it's already been purchased. I don't know. I'd have to look into that. Okay. And I have three sources that told me that. Okay. Okay. And I just want to make a statement. You know, we got a, an email. Go ahead. It says, oh. thank you. You know, a lot of stuff that I request or other board members request uh, through Monica is not trying to hinder our process of and our goal for our kids, but it's to get information because we as a board have to plan the future. And I know myself, if I can't get information, it's hard for me to sit up here and plan one to five, ten years down the road when I don't get information. So in the future, I would like to see the information we ask for is done and done in a proper manner. That's all I have. Just a little request to that, Joe, is that, I don't know if we passed policy on it, but it was consensus by the previous board that when somebody requests, you have to have two other people. So the request has to be at least a majority of the board. So an individual just can't do it themselves. Well, how can we send that if it's the sunshine law, if we can't? No, uh, you just that? email it. All you have to do is email yep, the president. Okay. You or email me, and then I'll call. All right, we'll and do if that. If I can find you and me or okay. another person, as long as we get three, that was no problem with that. So just just email me what you want or call me, okay. and then I'll I'll talk to. I was not aware of that policy. Okay. 
a lot of policies. Yeah, no, let's see. And then okay. I, I have a, just a few for everyone here. Number one is our Beyond Textbooks is going very well. Uh, I think our middle school even attended one of the presentations, and they weren't scheduled to be uh, come on board until next year, but we did talk to their staff, and we're going to meet with Kearney. And if they're, again, we told them if they have the majority of staff, 70%, 80%, on board that we will bring beyond textbooks to the middle school so that could happen for them this year also our turnaround plan I told you our innovation plans are going on pace and we should hopefully finalize those plans the final drafts by this week and then the last one is that uh, our high school we will have nine wrestlers representing Adams High School in the state final so they're doing a great job ten I'm sorry, I was off by one, but that's almost the majority of the team. So, again, we want to make sure we accent the positive things that are going on in our district. And the other? I have, I have one thing um, at, on top of everything else that's been talked about, but I was at the, uh, at the talent show at the, uh, at the high school, and there was, uh, I don't know how many, how many participants this year, but there was probably 18 of them. Um, it was well attended. The house was a packed house. I mean, you know, people, they like their schools. You know, they like what's going on at their, at their high school. And uh, it was very well attended by the community and the students. And every one of the um, student athlete events that I go to, um, the conversation that we had early on in the year with the high school there, with, um, with students participating and, and supporting the other, the other uh, aspects of sports um, the wrestling teams they're watching the girls basketball team the boys basketball team is watching the swimming and I mean it's all just uh, it's all starting to come together so thanks for your <coughs> conversation Mr. Rolla about uh, climate and culture because that is part of climate and culture so you know the kids are participating so all we can do is continue to support them thank you anybody else for the good of the cause all right Seeing that there is uh, there is no need for an executive session, correct? Okay. Uh, need a motion for adjournment. So moved. Second. Is there any discussion? Hearing none. Can we have roll call, Monica? Aye. 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 Okay. We are adjourned at eight twenty-nine.